Hi all, in this video we are going to discuss about hemoglobin. So the most important questions that have been asked in the theory exams are what are the different functions of hemoglobin and what are the derivatives of hemoglobin. But it is not enough that you just understand these two questions because this is a very important uh, basic knowledge that you should acquire in physiology. So you can expect a lot of questions from this part during your practical examinations. Okay. So on that note, let's just have uh, some information or just let's try to learn something about hemoglobin. So we know that hemoglobin is basically a protein which can carry oxygen. So it's an oxygen binding protein in the red blood cells and it appears during the normoblast stage. So in erythropoiesis, we know that it is in the normoblast stage that the cytoplasm will change its color to a more acidophilic one. Okay, so that is because of hemoglobin synthesis. The normal value of hemoglobin in adult males is around 15.5 gram per deciliter and whereas in females it is a bit less around 14 gram per deciliter. Now, now the difference is because in adult males you've got the male hormone testosterone which stimulates erythropoiesis. That is why in adult males we've got a higher value of hemoglobin. Not only based on gender, you, for different age groups the hemoglobin value might also be different. So during the fetal period as you can see the hemoglobin level is around 16.5 to 18.5 gram per deciliter which is a bit higher when compared to the adult group. Whereas in the newborns it's around 23 gram per deciliter. So why, why is it so, so high in the newborns? Well that is because in newborns they are in a state of hypoxia especially initially during the initial days and thus this hypoxia will stimulate erythropoiesis and thus their hemoglobin is a bit higher. Now this will return to around 10.5 gram per deciliter during the first three months of birth and after that it gra gradually increases to 12 gram per deciliter in, the, uh, 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 in uh, uh, around one year of age. So see in each age group the level of hemoglobin also slightly varies. Okay, so now we will see about the structure. So we know that hemoglobin basically contains a heme part and a globin part. So this heme part is formed inside the mitochondria and it is composed of iron bound to a porphyrin ring structure known as protoporphyrin. So what is protoporphyrin 9? Protoporphyrin 9 consists of four pyrrole rings linked together by methane bridges. And we've got an iron at the center of this porphyrin ring. It will be more clear when you see this figure. So see, suppose this is the heme. We've got an iron right at the center. And then attached to it, we've got pyrrole rings. So this is a, a schematic diagram showing a pyrrole ring. Like that, we've got four pyrrole rings. So they are attached by means of this methane bridge. Okay. So these four pyrrole rings forms protoporphyrin 9 and protoporphyrin 9 along with iron forms our heme. So this is the basic structure of heme. So thus one molecule of hemoglobin will contain four units of heme. See as you can see here we've got four units of heme in one molecule of hemoglobin which means we've got four iron atoms for oxygen to bind and each heme unit will be attached to a polypeptide chain of the globin. So thus you can see that there are four heme units, four polypeptide chains in a hemoglobin molecule. So now we will see about the globin part. So the globin part is formed in the ribosomes and it's basically a protein substance consisting of two pairs of polypeptide chains. So for example in hemoglobin A we've got four polypeptide chains of which two will be alpha chains which contains 141 amino acids and two will be beta chain which contain 146 amino acids. So it will be something like this. So as you can see we've got two alpha chains as well as two beta chains. So like that we've got pairs of polypeptide chains which form the globin part. So thus we have hemoglobin. So there are different types of hemoglobin. So we have normal hemoglobin as well as abnormal hemoglobin. Examples of normal hemoglobin are the one which we said just now, the adult hemoglobin or hemoglobin A which contains 2 alpha and 2 beta. Then we've got hemoglobin A2 which is a variant of the normal adult hemoglobin. Then we've got fetal hemoglobin like the hemoglobin BART and embryonic hemoglobins like Gover and Portland. So this is seen during the embryonic period and this is seen during the fetal, uh, fetal period. 
and other two the a1 a and a2 is formed during the is seen during the adult time we've also got abnormal hemoglobins so examples of abnormal hemoglobins are hemoglobin s hemoglobin c hemoglobin d hemoglobin e as well as other unstable hemoglobins so for all these hemoglobin the basic problem is that they've got a mutation in which one or two amino acids might be placed differently so in that case the normal structure of the rbc will be will not be formed and thus it can cause a lot of complications for individuals having such hemoglobin we'll see more about this abnormal type of hemoglobin when we learn about hemoglobinopathies okay so now let's move on to the important part functions of hemoglobin so we know that the definition says we said it's a oxygen binding protein so the main function of hemoglobin is to transport oxygen from the lungs to the tissues so an important question that can be asked here is what is the oxygen carrying capacity so see 1 gram of hemoglobin carries 1.34 ml of oxygen when fully saturated remember it is 1 gram of hemoglobin carries 1.34 ml of oxygen so the combination of hemoglobin with oxygen is known as oxygenation and when the oxygen molecules combine with i ferrous in the heme they form oxyhemoglobin so oxygen molecules combine with ferrous to form oxyhemoglobin right so the you have to uh, remember the terms oxygenation oxyhemoglobin and what oxygen carrying capacity is next important function is it transports carbon dioxide from tissues to the lungs it not only carries oxygen but also carbon dioxide so when carbon dioxide combines with hemoglobin the product formed is called carbamino hemoglobin it is not carboxy hemoglobin it is carbamino hemoglobin so the hemoglobin uh, which is returning with the carbon dioxide from tissues is called reduced hemoglobin okay so see hb plus co2 will give you carbamino hemoglobin next important function is that hemoglobin can act as a buffer and thereby maintain the blood ph uh, we have seen more about this in our uh, buffers present inside the blood wherein the hemoglobin acts as a buffer hemoglobin also destroys the physiologically important nitric oxide molecule so it will helps in maintaining the normal levels of nitric oxide it also impart the red color to the blood and that is why the erythrocytes look red because of the presence of hemoglobin pigment so these are the important functions of hemoglobin transport oxygen transport carbon dioxide its buffer function it uh, its physiological actions and that it imparts a red color now what are the different hemoglobin ligands or derivatives of hemoglobin so the first example is nitroso hemoglobin what is nitroso hemoglobin hemoglobin when combined with nitric oxide forms nitroso hemoglobin okay so the nitric oxide stimulates guanylate cyclase forming cyclic gmp and this actually mediates vasodilation it also inhibits platelet aggregation and affects the macrophage cytotoxicity so whenever no or nitric oxide combines with hemoglobin it stimulates the formation of cyclic gmp and this has a following effects it mediates vasodilation inhibits platelet aggregation and affects the macrophage cytotoxicity so that is a function of nitroso hemoglobin next important derivative is carbamino hemoglobin which we just mentioned when carbon dioxide combines with hemoglobin we have carbamino hemoglobin so carbon dioxide combines with globin and not with the heme so see oxygen combines with the heme whereas carbon dioxide combines with the globin part so the formation of carbamino hemoglobin facilitates the transport of carbon dioxide from tissues to the lungs so what is carboxy hemoglobin carboxy hemoglobin is otherwise called carbo monoxy hemoglobin it is formed when hemoglobin combines with carbon monoxide so see here the heme part is being combined with carbon monoxide and thus we will have carboxy hemoglobin so see the major difference is that this car carbon monoxide has got high affinity to hemoglobin is approximately 200 times more uh, if it has 200 times more affinity to hemoglobin than oxygen so that is why it uh, even in low concentrations of carbon monoxide the uh, hemoglobin will immediately bind with it and that is a cause for carbon monoxide poisoning 
So for formation of carboxyhemoglobin is reversible. When carbon monoxide is removed, hemoglobin can bind back with the oxygen. So that is why when a patient has carbon monoxide poisoning, it is important that we have to remove the carboxyhemoglobin first so that oxygen can bind with the hemoglobin and thereby resume its transport process. Okay. So remember carbamino is for hemoglobin plus carbon dioxide. Carboxyhemoglobin is hemoglobin plus carbon monoxide. Next is methemoglobin. What is methemoglobin? Hemoglobin with oxidized iron. See normally we have got iron in the ferrous state. But if it is in the ferric state, we can say that it is methemoglobin. Hemoglobin with oxidized iron is called methemoglobin. So normally its concentration is very low. But in the presence of certain chemicals or drugs, its formation can increase. However, the, the safe thing is that the formation of methemoglobin is reversible. Now, the, why are we talking about it? Because if the concentration of oxidized iron or of methemoglobin is more, it can mimic cyanosis. So, that is the applied or important aspect about the concentration of methemoglobin. Okay. Now, the next, now the next derivative is sulfhemoglobin. So, here as the name suggests, sulfur is bound to the porphyrin ring. It is not attached to the iron, but it is attached to the porphyrin ring. It is usually formed when the hemoglobin is exposed to sulfur containing drugs or chemicals. Now, the problem is that the formation of sulfhemoglobin is irreversible. So, once it is formed, it can persist throughout the life of the carrier RPC. So, that is a yeah, important clinical aspect of self hemoglobin. Now, the most important derivative of hemoglobin, which is important clinically, is the HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin. So, here the glucose attaches to the terminal valine of the beta chain. So, see if this is a beta chain, the glucose will attach to this beta chain. So, in normal individuals, the HbA1c is less than 4 percentage of the total hemoglobin. But if in diabetics, what happens? This the binding of glucose will be more. So according to WHO criteria, if it is more than 6.5 percentage, it is considered abnormal, and it is seen especially in case of diabetes mellitus, Cushing syndrome, and hyperthyroidism. So usually, we in order to monitor for conditions with chronic high blood glucose, we we check the HbA1c and see if it is normal or not. So if there is uh, an increased HbA1c, it means that the person is chronically hyperglycemic over the last three months. Okay, so this is, a, this is one important derivative from a clinical point of view glycosylated hemoglobin or HbA1c. Right, so to summarize, we've uh, seen what hemoglobin is the basic structure, then we saw about the normal values, the structure of heme, the structure of globin, what are the functions of hemoglobin, and finally about the different derivatives of hemoglobin. So I hope this video was useful for you. Thank you.